Chapter 1 Michael McKenzie had been awake since four that morning. His heart was pounding even faster than when he took his position at a track meet, waiting for the starter's go. Finally, after what had seemed the longest year of his life, he would have wheels. Wheels and all the good things that went with them. The possibility swarmed like bees inside his head. He had been driving on his permit for the past year and had taken the driver's ed course at school. And now, one day after his 17th birthday, he would take his driver's test. By noon, he'd be a free man, free to go where he wanted, free to cruise without another licensed driver in the car, a free man with wheels, even if they were his dad's. There wasn't anything better on this earth. By six, the sun had begun to spread its orange glow over the treetops. Michael swung his feet to the floor, absent-mindedly combed his dark hair with his fingers, then reached to the foot of the bed where he had tossed his cutoffs the previous night. Suddenly, he was reminded of Amy Ruggiero and their sweaty ten minutes in the garage the day before. Darcy had been helping his mom with a potato salad. She hadn't suspected a thing. He told himself Amy Ruggiero was easy, because that was what everyone said. And she had proved it, hadn't she? But that didn't change the urgent desire that rippled unexpectedly through his stomach and beyond. He could not shake the image of Amy's sad brown eyes, her smooth hand on his cheek as she looked up at him. It wasn't as if they'd done anything, just made out. Still, there was that thing with her bikini top. He had accidentally torn off one of the straps. He couldn't even remember how it happened, but Amy hadn't said a word. She'd just knotted it around the thin strip of material that tied in the back. Such a simple thing, but it made her seem so vulnerable. He had said he was sorry, and he was. She had smiled and said it was okay. She'd fix it later. But somehow, it didn't seem okay. He wished he hadn't gone into the garage with her in the first place. He should have stayed with Darcy. He shot one leg into his cutoffs, then the other. Why was he thinking about Amy Ruggiero anyway, especially today? He had better things to think about, like getting his license. By 6.30, he had bolted down to two, two blueberry Pop-Tarts and a glass of orange juice and was headed over to Joe Sadowski's. Joe was the only one of his friends who had his own car, a Mustang, fire engine red with mag wheels, and he was letting Michael take his driver's test with it. Michael's dad had offered to go with him, had even offered him the family Honda Accord, but Michael explained that he'd already made other arrangements. Not that he minded his dad going with him. He didn't. It just looked better to go with a friend. Joe was still in bed. So was everyone else in the family except for Mr. Sadowski, who was getting ready for work and who showed up at the front door, towel in hand, with his flannel robe clinging to his dripping wet body. He stared at Michael as if the boy were a door-to-door -door salesman he was about to shout down. Joe ready? Michael fisted his hands in his pockets, trying to look casual. It isn't even seven o'clock. Mr. Sadowski rubbed the bald spot on top of his head with the towel. It gleamed a polished pink in the morning sunlight. He doesn't usually get out of bed till noon when he has to go to work. Joe worked at Burger King. It was a year-round job, although he put in longer hours in the summer, working afternoons and evenings. During the school year, he worked only late afternoons and Saturdays. That was how he paid for his car insurance and gas. I know, Michael explained, but I've got my driver's test this morning. He's going with me. Mr. T Sadowski seemed to consider this. Finally, he stepped aside and cocked his head toward the stairs. Good luck getting him up. A moment later, Michael stood over Joe's bed, studying him. Joe had kicked off the covers. His knees were drawn up to his chest, as if he couldn't get warm enough. He wore only black briefs, and his skin was puckered with goosebumps, even though it was already 75 degrees outside. Michael fought off a sudden urge to pull the top sheet over him. Hey, man, he said, giving Joe's shoulder a slight punch. Joe rolled over to his other side and pulled his knees deeper into his chest. Michael clamped his hand on Joe's shoulder again and rocked him back and forth. Joe blinked twice and closed his eyes. What do you think you're doing? He mumbled. His tongue was still swollen with sleep. We've got to be at the DMV by nine, Michael said. Joe opened one eye and glanced at the window. What time is it? Michael cleared his throat. I thought you'd need some time to get ready. Eat breakfast, maybe. Joe reached for the digital alarm clock. The bright blue numbers flashed 6.54. Oh, man. 
He lifted one leg and booted Michael in the stomach with his foot, sending him up against the wall. You're crazy, man. You know that? Still, by 8.30, the two of them were on their way to the Division of Motor Vehicles. Heavy metal blasted from the car's speakers, drowning out everything else, cocooning them in the throbbing, pulsating bass that seemed to come from the gas pedal. The music climbed Michael's leg and flooded his belly with sound. He beat his hands on the steering wheel in time to the rhythm. They had decided Michael would drive the car. He wanted to memorize the feel of the steering wheel, the amount of pressure needed on the brakes to bring the car to a slow, easy stop. As they cruised through town, he decided to practice parallel parking one more time, although he'd done it hundreds of times over the past year. Michael pulled up next to a beat-up blue citation. Neither of the boys noticed that the music on the radio had stopped. A commercial for radial tires squawked out at them, followed by a brief traffic report. Michael put the car in reverse and began slowly backing up, careful to turn the wheel enough to angle the back end of the car into the empty space. The front of the car was still in the middle of the street when he felt Joe's hand on his wrist. The pressure of his friend's fingers burned into his skin. Joe was staring down at the radio as if it were a time bomb about to explode. What? Michael asked. Shut up, Joe said, his voice a low, raspy whisper. Listen. The news reporter's voice was as smooth and even as a freshly planed board as he talked about the bizarre death on the 4th of July of a man from Briarwood, New Jersey. The man had been repairing shingles on his roof around noon when a bullet from nowhere had dropped from the sky and killed him instantly. The reporter concluded by making an appeal to anyone in the area who might have information that would help solve the local police, help the local police solve the case. Michael never finished parking the car. In fact, he was a mile down the road heading no place in particular before he realized he was still behind the wheel and presumably in control. Neither of the boys spoke for several minutes. Joe never bothered to tell Michael he was headed in the opposite direction from the DMV. When Joe finally did speak, he said, It could have been from anywhere. It could have been anyone. Michael's hands were so wet he was barely able to hold the steering wheel. He wanted to believe his friend. Joe was right. Lots of people had been shooting off firecrackers the day before. Probably shooting guns, too. Especially if they couldn't get their hands on a few packages of illegal fireworks. Anything to make noise. That's what the fourth was about, right? Making a lot of noise? Guns probably had been going off all over the place. Michael squeezed his eyes shut, as if he were fighting off a headache. Who was he kidding? The report had said it had happened around noon. That was when Michael had been showing off the Winchester to Joe. He looked over at his friend, saw the limp, dirty blonde waves of his shoulder-length hair brush his pale cheek as he stared down at the floor, and he knew Joe was thinking the same thing. I shot it into the air, Michael said, scarcely able to breathe. In the air, man. The bullet wasn't supposed to go any place. He pulled the car over to the shoulder and stopped. He did not trust himself to drive. Joe looked at him and shook his head. Michael couldn't tell whether he was disagreeing with him about the shooting or saying he didn't want to drive either. The two of them sat in the car, letting the sun bake them through the roof. It never occurred to Michael to turn the engine back on so they'd at least have air conditioning. Finally, Joe pulled himself up straight and brushed his damp hair behind his ears. A single gold earring in the shape of a skull dangled from his earlobe. He grabbed Michael's upper arm as he might have grabbed an, the arm of a drowning man. Listen, he said, leaning forward. It was an accident. But it's still manslaughter, right? You could go to prison for something like that, right? I don't know. Maybe. Joe shifted his gaze away from Michael's eyes. Anyway, I think when it's an accident, it's called involuntary manslaughter or something like that. He tightened his grip. Look, nobody has to find out. Not if you get rid of the gun. Michael felt the crab-like pinch of Joe's fingers digging into his bare flesh. He yanked his arm away. I'll know, he said. Get serious, man. Even if they don't send you to prison, think how this is going to look on your record. You can kiss all of those fancy sco colleges you were thinking of getting, of applying to. Michael thought about the stack of university catalogs and applications on his desk at home. He might not have been Ivy League material, but he was counting on going to a good school. 
Lee, maybe, or Lafayette. The full impact of what Joe had just said was beginning to sink in. This was his future they were talking about, everything Michael had been working for. There's some things you just got to live with, Joe was saying. Things you do, you know, stuff you don't want anybody to know about. Michael looked over at his friend. He'd known Joe since second grade. They'd been best friends all these years, even though they were as different as night and day. He also knew he was Joe's only real friend. Most of the other kids at school had more or less written Joe off back in eighth grade when he'd been caught smashing roadside mailboxes with a baseball bat at one o'clock in the morning, drunk. But no matter what kind of trouble Joe got into over the years, Michael still believed he was basically a decent person. And even more important, he was the most loyal friend Michael had ever had. Michael licked his lips. They were dry and tasted like salt. Yeah, well, what would you know about it? Come on, man. I've done things I ain't proud of. Nobody knows that better than you. Joe nodded slowly, his eyes narrowing to dark slits. You just live with it, that's all. But Joe was wrong. Michael knew he couldn't live with this. How could anybody live with this? Joe was watching him carefully, as if he expected him to suddenly lunge from the car into oncoming traffic. Anyway, Joe said, we can't be sure. That bullet would have had to travel over a mile. He wiped the sweat from his face with his Woodstock 2 t-shirt. Doesn't seem possible, you know. It would have hit a tree or something before it got that far. Michael wanted to believe him, but something in his gut told him otherwise. What were the odds that someone else had fired a gun into the air right around noon? He knew what he'd done. He knew that a bullet, unobstructed, could travel as far as a mile before it finally headed back down toward the earth. His stomach was churning violently. With one swift movement, he flung the door open, leaned over the side, and vomited. Joe slid further down in his seat. He covered his eyes with his hand and shook his head. We've got to make a pact, he said, as Michael let his head flop back against the headrest. When Michael didn't respond, he said, Neither of us says anything, okay? I mean, I was there, remember? I was a witness. And if I don't come forward, that makes me an accessory to the crime. I'm in just as deep as you, man, but I'm not about to help you screw up your future. Michael was only half listening. He felt as if his insides had been drained from him, as if he'd been stuffed with cotton. He did not trust himself to speak. Are you listening? Joe said. Because we gotta act like nothing's happened. We gotta turn this car around, and you gotta take your driver's test, just like everybody expects. He slapped the door handle with his hand, kicked the door open, and came around to the driver's side. Move over, he shoved Michael's shoulder. Get over, he said, pushing him to the passenger side. Then he slid behind the wheel and drove them to the DMV. Later, Michael hardly remembered the driver's test, remembered only how he'd felt as if he'd left his whole future sitting back there on the shoulder of the road. And when the man who gave him the test told him to turn right, Michael thought of all the years he had spent becoming the best track star Briarwood Regional had ever had. And he thought about the college applications he was planning to fill out. When the man told him to do a three-point turn, Michael carefully put the car in reverse and thought about his parents and his younger brother Josh. What would they do if they knew they were harboring a killer under their roof? For that was what he was, right? A murderer? He tried to let the word penetrate, but it lay like a lump of lead, silent and unspoken, on his tongue. Accident or not, he had taken another person's life. And when the man told him to drive down the block and turn left at the stop sign, Michael thought, for some crazy reason, about Amy Ruggiero and her torn bikini top, and suddenly he wanted to cry. He did not pass his driver's test. He would have to try again later. He did not pass, because when the man told him to pull up next to the orange cones and then parallel park, Michael found he could not think clearly. His eyes burned so badly he couldn't see. His hands shook so much that he could not hold the steering wheel. Desperate, he reached for the key, shut off the engine, and climbed out of the car, leaving the keys in the ignition. The man, wearing a short-sleeved white shirt but no jacket, had loosened his tie and stared through the window at Michael, who had simply turned and walked away. Later that day, Michael went to a hardware store and bought a three-and-a-half-foot piece of PVC pipe and two end caps. That night, while the rest of his family slept, he put the Winchester inside the pipe. 
sealed the two end caps to keep water from getting in, carefully unstacked the firewood from behind from the pile behind the garage, dug a three foot deep trench, buried the rifle, and restacked the wood. Then he went to bed and lay awake the entire night, wondering if he would ever sleep again.